Far away from the heartlands of Islam, Muslims in South and Southeast Asia make up nearly two-thirds of the global Muslim population. The emergence of the religion was in the early era of Islam, but no one could have predicted the explosive effect it would have. Asia Wide looks at the seeds, the growth and the blossoming of Islam, which has defined the region as we see it today. Speaking to its experts on the Muslim heritage of this culturally rich part of the world. In this episode, we look at Indonesia, the world's most populated Muslim country, with over 200 million followers. It's the world's largest island country, with more than 13,000 islands, consisting of hundreds of distinct native ethnic and linguistic groups. Indonesia's national motto, Bineka Tungalika, or Unity in Diversity, conveys this character. We spoke to Dr. Carol Kirsten, who is Senior Lecturer in the Study of Islam and the Muslim World at King's College London, and author of the book, A History of Islam in Indonesia, Unity in Diversity. So thank you, Dr. Carol Kirsten, for joining us on Asia Wired. Um, Indonesia, far away from the heartland of Islam, has the world's largest Muslim population, with over a quarter of a billion people. Could you explain a bit about how Indonesia was before the adoption of Islam uh, and then its early seeds? Yes, it is indeed uh, the case that uh, in spite of being very important in terms of numbers that uh, Indonesia and actually the wider Southeast Asian region is often not getting the attention um, it deserves because it is a sort of on the geographical uh, periphery of um, the Muslim world. And that explains also that if we look at pre-Islamic times, um, there's basically a presence of uh, all the religious deposits which came from India. There's a very rich Buddhist uh, and Hindu legacy, but also a whole wide scala of indigenous animist religious practices. And of course, that all starts to change when Islam makes an appearance in the region. And a, a, a lot of that has, uh, it's a story that has not been, been told fully yet, exactly for the the reasons you, you sketched, it's not in the Middle East and there is a tendency among scholars of Islam to focus primarily on uh, the Middle East, the Arabic speaking parts, uh, Turkey and Iran and to some extent maybe Central Asia and even South Asia. But uh, Southeast Asia is often forgotten. And actually specialists in, uh, in, in that region, Indonesianists or people working on the wider Southeast Asian region, see also have a tendency to play down the role of Islam in the region. It's often seen as a thin veneer over these older religious uh, deposits. But if, uh, if you start examining it in, in more detail, uh, you actually see that this is not true. Now, obviously, because of where it is geographically, um, Southeast Asia has its own story to tell. And one thing we can say is that Indonesia and, and what are now Malaysia, uh, Brunei and the southern provinces of uh, Thailand and the Philippines, they are part of maritime Southeast Asia. And indeed, the, the arrival of Islam in that area was relatively late. And another distinct feature is that the introduction was peaceful. What I mean by that is that uh, uh, the adoption of Islam by indigenous populations uh, did not take off uh, until probably the 12th, 13th century. Obviously, the region was trading with the Middle East and South Asia uh, even before Arabs, Persians and South Asians became Muslims. Uh, but for a long time, there was maybe a presence of expatriate Muslim trader communities, but we have no evidence from the region itself until, say, late 13th century that something is changing. We find tombstones where local rulers adopt Arab names. They are no longer rajas, they become sultans. Uh, and that is further corroborated also uh, by uh, external sources, like for example, uh, the memoirs of Marco Polo, the Venetian explorer who visited northern Sumatra in uh, the late 13th century and actually reported that local rulers 
were uh, embracing Islam and that also the population was uh, following suit. So that is relatively late. And we also know for that reason that the expansion of Islam uh, into the region was not part of the early Arab conquests of uh, the 7th and 8th centuries. Uh, that of course has had an influence of what Islam looks like in the region. But, but if we first look at, at this arrival and the introduction of Islam, uh, we have to look at four questions. The first one being, when did it come? I lifted the veil on that a little bit. Uh, from where was it introduced and by whom? And especially in regards to the latter, you might also have some indication of the why question. Why did it happen and when and why in that particular point in time. Now as I said we have local material evidence by archaeology of, of tombstones that, that, that local rulers have decided to become Muslims. The interesting thing of the tombstones is, is that they were not produced locally. We know from the, the style of the tombstones and the materials used that they actually must originate from Gujarat in India. That does not mean that they may have been fabricated there, but at least the materials and the artisans who made these things were familiar with the cultural styles of Northwest India. Uh, so by the 13th, 14th century, we get an indication that the people of Southeast Asia uh, start to uh, move towards Islam. It's a sort of a dragged out process. Historians have often suggested that uh, you might want to consider it first in terms of adhesion, that Earlier religions are maybe not even given up completely yet, but that Islam becomes part of a very multifaceted uh, picture. Now the next question that poses us, of course, is uh, we are in Southeast Asia, from where did it come? Uh, obviously, you always look for the most obvious first, and then South Asia is a prime candidate, not only for trade relations, but also proximity. And it has been suggested that because of the presence of the tombstones, uh, Gujarat, Northwest India, must have been involved in one way or another. But it of course makes also perfect sense to look closer to home and, and, and suggest that Bengalis and Tamils from the Coromandel coast were, were involved in one way or another as well. Uh, in addition to that, there are also uh, stories locally in Southeast Asia that China has something to do with the introduction of Islam as well, but that would go then in stages. We do know from uh, Islamic historiography that China was Islamized very early. There's even hadith that the Prophet's uncle was involved in that, but due to political reasons, eventually Chinese uh, Muslims were persecuted and often were forced to go uh, uh, live elsewhere. And there are indications that China may have been involved, but then always uh, an old kingdom in what is now South Vietnam called Champa may have been involved as well. There is certainly linguistic uh, and a sort of a mythological links between the Cham people of Champa in South Vietnam and Cambodia and the Javanese. Uh, so th these are a sort of indications that it is quite a complex picture and, and to make things worse we also know that there have been direct contacts very early on with, say, the cradle of Islam in the Middle East. Arabs and Persians were involved in this conversion process as well. Yeah? So we have multiple points of origin that may have had an influence on the introduction of different parts of Indonesia. Indonesia itself is already a challenge. It's a massive country. It stretches over uh, 8,000 kilometers, 16,000 islands, hundreds of ethnic groups and languages to go by and, and the presence of any conceivable religious tradition um, we find in the world uh, today. So once you have established that, then the interesting question becomes of who did this? Uh, now I mentioned already that the trade routes were important. Southeast Asia uh, had long established relations with China via the South China Sea and of course via the Indian Ocean with South Asia, uh, Persia, the Arabian Peninsula and probably even East Africa as well. So it's very tempting to suggest that uh, it traveled along with trade. But you have to be careful with that. Uh, traders, merchants are there to do business, not to convert people. 
but it does not preclude the possibility that the trade routes doubled also as the conduits for, well, call it Islamic missionaries to use the same trade routes uh, in the process. If we look at the time of the introduction, late 13th century, that coincides with a wider development in the Muslim world. That is namely the collapse of the Abbasid Caliphate in 1258 as a result of uh, the Mongol invasions, uh, which basically deprived the Muslim world even uh, of a semblance or a symbolic unity. The Caliphate is sort of collapsed as a unifying political unit. And the social fabric of the Muslim world from then on is a sort of held together by a new phenomenon, the transnational Sufi orders, the Tariqas. They come up exactly in that point in time. And indeed, they stretch from Morocco in the west, eventually all the way also into the region we are interested in today, Indonesia, where uh, we have evidence that from the 13th, 14th century, um, the sheikhs and peers of all kinds of Sufi orders also make an appearance in Southeast Asia. So we have a very complex picture. There is no a uh, single Big Bang Theory, as one of the historians uh, specializing in this early process has once um, phrased it. You know, there are multiple modalities, different places from where it came to different parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and basically every region in Southeast Asia, uh, that, that huge island world uh, that encompasses now, you know, at least five countries, uh, has its own story to tell. That brings us to the last part of, say, the early history of Islam in, uh, in Indonesia. It's the why question. Uh, I challenge already the idea that trade was uh, a prime reason, because if that was so, um, Indonesians have also always historically traded with Chinese. Why did not Chinese religions then take root in Southeast Asia? Because the presence of Confucianism and Taoism in Southeast Asia has always remained confined to the expatriate Chinese populations. Malays, Javanese, uh, Filipinos never adopted Chinese religions, but large scores of people have converted to Islam. Uh, one other suggestion has been it is the European invasions, in first instance the Portuguese, but of course uh, with the material evidence we have and the reports of Marco Polo, that predates the arrival of the Portuguese. They don't arrive in Southeast Asia until 1511 with the conquest of Malacca. So you can discount that possibility as well for the introduction. It does not mean that Islam has not uh, a role in, say, resisting later invasions. That's an entirely different story. Uh, but I think you have to look at power structures within Southeast Asia and there the geography of Southeast Asia becomes very important. We are looking at maritime Southeast Asia, an island world where you see trading communities settling on the coasts and at the mouth of big river systems. The interior, mostly of the islands uh, of Southeast Asia until quite recently, was jungle. So there is no hinterland that provides a viable economic basis for empire building. It's a very different story in the mainland. Burma, Thailand, Cambodia have huge uh, river plains, uh, flat, where you can engage in intensive rice cultivation, which creates the economic surplus that is needed to build empires. And we have seen that in Burma in Pagan, Ayutthaya in Thailand, and the Khmer civilization in Cambodia. These powers often were able to reduce the populations of uh, the Malay Peninsula, the islands of Indonesia, Southern Thailand, Southern Philippines, to vassal status in the feudal system that existed then. And there have been suggested that local rulers in that island world wanted to wrest themselves free from that influence and that for that they had to look for alternative political allies. And they eyed the Indian Ocean Zone which created an opportunity. One historian has called the Indian Ocean uh, a neutral contact zone in the sense that no single political power has ever been able to fully dominate that vast expanse. If you were repressed, there was always another place to go. 
Yeah. So uh, gradually over time, the Indian Ocean has grown into what they sometimes call an is Islamic Yukumini. The uni what unites people from East Africa, Arabia, Persian, and South Asia is Islam. And the Southeast Asians are sort of see an advantage in becoming part of that and wrestle themselves free from the influence of these Hindu-Buddhist empires in mainland Southeast Asia. So uh, with that you have a sort of a plausible scenario that explains the, the dynamics that start to take uh, um, a hold of the region and, and, and increase in velocity and, and speed from the say the 13th, 14th centuries onwards. Uh, by that time we also have the first uh, regional chronicles or narratives uh, narrating these stories of, of conversion. We do not have copies of that time because you know manuscripts uh, in that tropical climate are very perishable but the stories we can reconstruct do go back to the 13th and 14th centuries and we have recently also found some intriguing evidence, textual evidence actually in places like Yemen where there is reference being made to people from Southeast Asia. The Arabs used a collective term and have continued to use a collective term for Muslims from Southeast Asia. The term they use is Jawi and it does not refer only to the island of Java. It is still used uh, for everybody inhabiting that, that huge expanse from Sumatra all the way up to Papua New Guinea. These people are referred to as the Jawi. You can still find it in Saudi Arabia today in the souks. They still sell Oud Jawi, which means basically Indonesian sandalwood. So the, the terms have stuck linguistically even. And we have references in, 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 in Yemeni manuscripts uh, to a Mas'ud al-Jawi as early as the 14th century. Yeah? And that presence is also very important if, if we start looking at the next phase of Islam. After the introduction, we, we see it take root uh, and expand and also develop in, say, a distinct Islamic culture alongside what we find elsewhere, an Arab a Persian, a Turkish, and so, a Swahili uh, Islamic culture. Southeast Asia developed what is called the Jawi, or the Malay Muslim uh, culture. In part two, we look at the influence Islam played in the next phase in Indonesian history, the colonial period under the Dutch East Indies. How did faith in Indonesia influence resistance against the colonial masters, and what role does it now play in modern-day Indonesia? The Dutch make an effort to bring this unwieldy and fiercely independent Muslim Sultanate under its control. The Aceh Wars, as they became known, I always call it, this is the Dutch Vietnam. 